get to record something? That gets my goat. All right, folks, this is Rich Outfield. And Big Anklevich. Welcome back to That Gets My Goat. And we're talking about The Dark Knight Rises. So, Rich Outfield, you came, came back, back to, to die, die with your city. city. No, I actually left my keys in here. If you'll just give me a minute. <laughs> Oh, uh, sorry. Carry on. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so like I was saying before, we knew that this was going to be the last one. The final installment in the Dark Knight trilogy with a capital T. And I, I, I do wonder, when did this series become a trilogy? Was it just in between movie two and movie three? Yeah, I think it was. It was when Chris Nolan said, okay, this is my last one I'm doing. Then it became a trilogy. Because number one and number two really had nothing to do with each other, aside from the fact that the characters returned. They weren't connected really at all. Was there anything connecting the first two films at all? Can you think of a moment where they flashed back to something? Or did his dad come down and say, why did we fall, Bruce? Oh, okay. I hear what you're saying. Anything? Yeah, I, I... Not necessarily. I mean, there was the the playing card at the end of the first movie, and then they built on that. And, of course, the Scarecrow had gotten away in the first movie, and then he's captured in the early scene of the second. Uh But it was another installment in the adventures of the Chris Nolan Batman. Which is fine. And uh, I don't know if the reaction to Dark Knight was why they decided to end it with three. But it certainly wasn't because people were tired of this franchise. Yeah, definitely. But as soon as they announced, you know, that this was it, it started putting thoughts in people's heads or at least thoughts in in my head of, okay, well, what would you do if you were able to just do whatever you wanted? Because there's not going to be any following you. That's something that a lot of these, I mean, nobody has ever made the final James Bond adventure movie. Right. Or things like that, where it's like, okay, because nobody is coming after this one, we can, we could kill James Bond. We could just put all of our cards on the table and lay everything out and and just have real consequences. And to me, that was an advantage over the other movies, over any long-term franchise. When you decide that Return of the Jedi is going to be the end then you can have the Rebel Alliance definitively destroy the bad guys, you know, kill Darth Vader, kill the Emperor, have Leia choose which guy that she likes. And it's similar in a way because Lucas had intended to just make a ton of these. You know, at one point he said 12 and later on he said nine Star Wars movies and we're just going to make tons. And then when he decided he didn't want to anymore, it became three. And their long-term plans went out the window and you know who he had intended to be the other suddenly was no longer the other and it just yeah everything had to be tied up with a bow and said okay it's all done this is it was the star wars trilogy yeah i think this was similar to that in a way i always talk of there's somewhere an alternate universe where he did make nine movies or they did just make an interminable series yeah, they did, as uh, Weird Al Yankovic sang in that Yoda song. Oh, we'll be making these film movies till the end of time. He says, the long-term contract I had to sign says I'll be making these movies till the end of time. Oh, with my Yoda. Yeah, probably. I think that's what everybody expected. And that was a- just after Empire Strikes Back came out. They were assuming this was going to go on and on and on. And then... Just like Chris Nolan, he changed his mind, and and that was it. But yeah, it it is kind of strange going into this. You know, this is supposed to be the last one. How are they going to tie it up? How are they going to tie it up in a satisfying way? Are they going to make it end in a way where you'll be like, okay, that's the end? Are they going to leave something open? Are they going to, what are they going to do? I guess that could be an advantage. Uh... I think the biggest disadvantage that this film had was just trying to live up to how much everybody loved the earlier film. Could they make it as great? I don't know. What do you think? How did you like it? (laughs) Well, we're getting to the nitty gritty already. Ah, shoot. It's going to sound callous of me, but I liked it nowhere near as much as I liked The Dark Knight. 
And it's not fair because I was so pleasantly surprised by The Dark Knight. You know, I, I didn't have monstrously high expectations for it. Right. And I thought that I had realistically lowered my expectations for this. But maybe I hadn't. I I, I don't know. Yeah, it's got to be hard to do. I, I don't know how. I mean, I, I kind of had lowered expectations for it as well. But I don't know if that helps necessarily. We saw it with my brother-in-law and his expectations were really high. He was super excited. He was ready for this to be so great. And he, I think he liked it more than either of us. Okay, but at the same time, I saw it with my cousin who is incapable of liking anything that, that he's not told that he has to like. He's, he's just not got a discriminating, critical mind like we do. And when it came out, he or when when we came out of the theater, he said that wasn't as good as Dark Knight. I don't think that was even as good as Batman Begins. And I didn't say anything to him. I was just like, wow, OK, you and I are totally on the same page. <laughs> cool. It's interesting that you also felt that. Yeah, I, I liked it. I couldn't decide whether it was better or worse than Batman Begins, but it definitely wasn't as good as Dark Knight, unfortunately. Yeah, they were just. Too many things that I saw in it that bothered me um, that I didn't see in those other two films. I didn't notice anything like that in the other two films where I just went, oh, come on, really? So it was still a great movie, though. It was really good. And yet all I can think of is, that, oh, yeah, it d- <laughs> d- didn't measure up. <laughs> if it was like somehow a standalone film, I would I would not be saying any of this kind of stuff. If this was like The Avengers the first movie in the bunch, I'd be like, wow, that was so good. And yeah, there was a couple spots that could have used some help, but oh, in general, it was so great. It just doesn't give it a a fair shake. It doesn't have its chance to stand on its own. So uh, what were some of the things that you didn't like about it or did like about it? Okay, well, if it's okay, I'd like to talk about the things that I did like. And maybe we can have a literal that gets my goat episode where we talk about the natives. OK, yeah, let's let's go ahead and start with that, because, you know, there, there was a very mild backlash against the Dark Knight in the years after it came out and people would bring up things that they didn't like. There's no way a bunch of people wouldn't kill a bunch of prisoners on another boat and, you know, things like and every time somebody would give their reasons why the movie was overrated or not awesomely great. I'd be like, "Eh, I don't see it. No, I, that moment in the 2008 dark Knight where the big scary black, Oh, I've already said that in a dark, in a, that gets my goat recently when that guy takes the detonator and you think, uh Oh, and he throws it out the window. To me, that's the greatest moment in that whole film. (laughs) Yeah. And there's the, also the scene where the, uh, the big truck, gets flipped yeah it's so that's good the, those are like the two scenes that are most awesome to me in the movie and 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 just like everything that a ton of people like there there's a certain there's there's what i call the shrek syndrome there's a backlash oh you know something that people mock all the time is the christian bale batman voice swear to me uh-huh it's never bothered me. I've never had a problem with that. I'm Batman. Yeah, it doesn't really bother me. There are times, and I actually noticed it a fair amount in this particular film, there are times where it can make his lines hard to understand. And I also found the same thing to be the case with Bane. Also, the sound in the theater, I, I, no, I can't say it because it was bad in both times I saw it difficult to understand some of the things that he said i don't know what to say about that because obviously all of his lines were adr right i would assume so yeah i mean he's got that thing over his face so they must have done him afterwards you know i didn't see that imax preview last year whenever it was i guess it was around christmas time but there were all sorts of complaints about how difficult bane was to understand in that and Nolan said, you know, it's going to be fixed. You won't have problems. And and then I think later I read somewhere it was exactly the same. Yeah, I don't know. I did have problems here and there, I'll have to admit. He would say stuff and I'd be like, wait, what did he say? Uh. 
often that would be resolved by context or whatever of what happened later, but uh, that was a, a little bit difficult. So we're talking about what you liked. Oh, sorry. And I sounded like, <laughs> no, no, but I was defending the things that other people had problems with in the last couple of movies. I didn't have those problems. Uh huh. But well, let's talk about Bane just for a second. He was really terrifying to me. Part of it was the the that you didn't see his mouth and the nose or whatever. He, so he he was less than human, but also just his build, the way that his body looked, was really frightening. I tend to be, and I I know you're that way too. I've always been a Decepticon guy. I've always been a Cobra <laughs> guy. I've always been a, a Galactic Empire guy who really likes the bad guys, and. I never rooted for Bane. I never found him likable. He, I, I loathed Bane. And my guess is we were supposed to. And so to me, that was really impressive. Also, I mean, because the Joker was crazy and Bane seemed to have a little bit more method to his madness. I still really liked the Joker, never liked Bane. I just, yeah, oh. What, what were your thoughts on Bane as a character? Yeah, I kind of felt the same way. Uh, he he was really scary. He was a really good bad guy. He was huge in kind of a weird way too, though. He didn't <laughs> look like buffed. You know what I mean? I do know what you mean. Yeah, the, there was something wrong with his body. Yeah, he was really tall. But the rest of it, he just looked like he was bulky. You know, it wasn't like he was really muscly or something like that. He was just a big dude. But yeah, and not being able to see his mouth. And, and when I was in film school way back when, it's one of the things that they talked about in one of my classes. It was a theater class, actually, though, and they were talking about costume design and things like that. And they were saying that, in general, you cover somebody's... They say you cover their communicators and you will automatically not trust this person. So if you cover somebody's face then you won't trust them. So you take somebody who's wearing a mask, like a Darth Vader or something, you know, th this person is automatically less trustworthy than Luke Skywalker because you can see him. You cover their mouths. Even just putting like a beard or a mustache or a, you know, something like that already makes somebody become a bad guy in your mind because that's their communicators or whatever. I guess so, but I love Darth Vader, and I know you do too. Right, but he's a bad guy. And there's all those Imperials around him that you do see the face, and you always take Vader's side. <laughs> I suppose there are ways to buck that. And, you know, putting a mask on doesn't make them look cooler fairly often, uh, but it doesn't give you trust. You know, you, you don't trust them. You don't expect them to do things right for you. But the other thing is gloves. If someone is wearing gloves, you won't trust them because apparently your hands are also a communicator. Hmm. Um, that's that's very interesting. I, I don't know that I believe any of it. <laughs> <laughs> because, okay, you asked me what I liked. I love that he didn't take off his mask constantly through this movie, uh, Batman. Something that in all three of the Spider-Man movies, especially the, the third one, well, all four of the Spider-Man movies, any excuse he has to take off his mask, he does. And if you recall, the Green Goblin took off his mask and Venom kept having the, the stuff juge off so you could see <laughs> Topher Grace's face. And I'd just be like, why? Why are you guys doing that? Especially for somebody like Spider-Man who, if anybody sees his face, it's over. Right. Why would you constantly take, why would you take your mask off? And, and there's a moment in Amazing Spider-Man where he takes his mask off as some kind of, hey, I'm a human being, look. Don't hate me. And I was just like, don't ever take your... Uh, dude, Aunt May is dead now. Thanks a lot. Right. Yeah, there's one moment when he's with Alfred where he doesn't wear his mask. And all the rest of the time, he's got his mask on. And I, I really appreciate that because the whole point of the mask, whether you believe that somebody wouldn't recognize that is Bruce Wayne or not, is disguise. Yeah. Is that this guy could be anybody. And yeah, with Spider-Man, you don't know if he's young. You don't know if he's old. You don't know if he's black or white or Asian or whatever. You know, anybody can. Yeah, that's the thing with Dark Knight. Anybody could be Batman. Anybody could be Spider-Man. I could be that guy. And so I liked the mask. And, you know, I've complained about the costume before in the, uh, the Dark Knight. No, in Batman Begins, I didn't really like the costume. But I've certainly gotten used to it 
at this point, and you know, I felt like it looked cool. There weren't moments when it seemed really hokey. There were times when he was fighting, and I'd be like, all Bane has to do is step on that cape. But for the most part, I thought that the costume looked really cool. Yeah, I, I never uh, had much of a problem with it. I, I know they did update it in the last film, make it so that he could like turn his head and whatnot, which I, I suppose makes it more serviceable and more functional and stuff like that. And makes it look better on film because he can act more with it as well instead of having to turn his whole body to see somebody and stuff. Go on. <laughs> okay, well, you're a really big movie score guy. What did you think of the score? I really liked the score for this one. I, I think I mentioned it to you right after we were done. That's one of the things that I found to be actually superior from this film to the last one. The score in this one was much better. It didn't get off into other things. It stuck with you had that that Batman theme that you hear through all of the three films. And then aside from that, it, I swear, I don't know... If it was just that he kept playing the same two notes over and over again, you know, it's that thing that Hans Zimmer does all the time. He just has that. He does that in pretty much every film he does. Uh, and this was no exception to, to that rule. He did it again. And at a certain point, I swear it had been playing for like 20 minutes, that same thing. And I'm just like, ah, I can't take the tension anymore. <laughs> Give me something else. <laughs> But the, um, the theme that I, I consider to be Bane's theme, the muffler, muffler, boom, boom, muffler, you know, the chanting thing or whatever. Oh, yeah. The rise, rise, whatever. That, that was they're saying. so cool. And just like almost every time he was on the screen, you'd hear that either really subtly or big and bombastically. I don't know. I, I've, I've liked that. And that has been a real push since like Lord of the Rings and the Phantom Menace and all that to have like choruses. Right. In, in your score. Um, and I, I think Elfman did it on the Tim Burton Batman movies, too. Yeah, he did. Uh, but it really worked here, just this uh, almost a primitive, the natives are restless kind of chanting uh -huh. that just made you nervous or, or, or it's like, uh-oh, you know. Th that was neat to me. And, and yeah, I don't pick up on the scores usually as well as you do. Uh, I think I had asked you, okay, well, what happened to the other guy? Who was the other guy, James Newton Howard? Uh, yeah, it was James Newton Howard. For the first two, they had both of them doing it, which I never understood how that can work and why they had two composers. The only time I can think of a movie that had that happen before was The Last of the Mohicans from way back when in the 90s. That movie had a composer and... He did, the, the first guy did all the music that you remember from that movie, the stuff that was good and that you liked. And for some reason, the director didn't like it or something. And he fired that guy and hired another guy on. And this guy did a couple other things, which was garbage and not even worthy of remembering. But, you know, both of their names are on there. It's soundtrack by this guy and this guy. But obviously, this was not the case with these Batman films because they brought him back again to the second film. And somehow not again to the third film. I don't understand why they changed it up. But, you know, it was a good decision because I thought it was better than it was before. Okay. Boy, I, there's so many things to talk about. The vehicles were really, really neat. I love, in the second movie, there was the, the motorcycle called the Bat Pod. Uh -huh. And there was something that it did with its wheels in this movie. Yeah. It was so awesome. That every time it happened, I was just like, ah, oh my gosh. I, and I don't know why I responded the way that I did. But when Batman is driving it, it did it. And then when Catwoman is driving it, it did it. And it was just the, the wheels would would turn differently than any motorcycle wheels have ever turned before. Yeah. Like when, when you, and it would make a cool sound. When you peel out around a hard corner or something, the, the wheels turned sideways and went, made that sound, the skidding, skipping, whatever you want to call it, sound. I guess that was what kept it from tipping over or something like that when, when you would make a turn like that. But yeah, that was really interesting. And then there was the bat, which was like the, the bat. Let's just call it the bat helicopter. But it had the rotor underneath. Yeah. Again, something I'd never seen before. And every time it was on screen, I'd just be like, wow. But yeah, it was, it was basically the bat copter or the bat wing or whatever. I hated that they just called it the bat. That drove me crazy. Just like, come on. Yeah. 
Ugh. But yeah, that was a really cool vehicle, and they kept bringing it in here and there and everywhere to blow things up and to do all sorts of stuff. That, you know, in the last movie, you had the bat pod, but that thing got hardly any screen time compared to what this the bat got. He didn't drive a bat mobile at all in this one, did he? Did he not have his tumbler? I don't think I we ever saw him no, driving the, one. The Bane had tumblers. Yeah, the so bad guys so. stole them, and they were driving around those desert camo-looking ones. But you never had Batman driving one. Huh. Well, I, I, another thing that I loved about the Bat <laughs> and the Bat Pod was they looked like they were really there. And I there were moments when I'd be like, was that CG? Is that CG? What am I looking at? Is there really a vehicle like that? <laughs> and when they can fool the eye like that, maybe maybe it was just really good CG, but maybe it was also models and maybe there was a full scale one and and you know they were cutting intercutting in between these. That's how filmmaking should be. Yeah. You know, trick the eye and if it's been on screen too long, switch it up the way that you do it and but there were moments in avengers or whatever where you see you you know that that thing's not really there right but on this one i don't know if there is actually a bat uh, wing whatever you call it bat <laughs> helicopter that was on cables and they just erased the cables i don't know to the bat copter robin it, it was very cool uh that i, I was kind of irritated to see catwoman hop onto that bat pod <laughs> you were and be able to do that sideways spinning thing though you know just like, isn't that the first time she's ever driven this? How does she know that it does this thing? Because I didn't even know it did that thing, and I saw the last movie. Ah, that's a good point. <laughs> Just like, wow. I mean, okay, she's a capable woman and everything, but it seems she like... Had a, she had a case of everything you can do, I can do better. Right. That That's taken a little too far, it seemed. Sorry, I'm not supposed to say things I disliked, though. This is the, no, no, the like right. uh, episode. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I thought that the vehicles were really neat. And uh, the, the special effects, when the bridges are blowing, when the football stadium is being blown up, when you just see long, high up shots of Gotham City and there's explosions all over or there's ice under the bridge or you can see the bridges out or you can see fires, uh, you know, in the distance and all that. That all looked totally real to me. Yeah, I really appreciated the when, you know, they blew all the bridges. You get that really, really wide shot and you see like three bridges blowing at once. Almost silently, too. Silently, like it would be if that was really happening. You know, if you had a camera that high up and that far away, you wouldn't hear the explosion until, you know, many seconds after it happened, if you heard it at all, because it's so far away. The fact that light travels so much faster than sound, so you see an explosion way before you can hear it. I thought that was really cool that they did that, you know. It, it's kind of like how I've always loved uh, how Firefly, unlike any other spaceship show there was, didn't use sound effects when they did the shots outside of the ship. Because sound doesn't carry in space, so you don't hear any sound. You wouldn't hear anything. Is that why they show it on the Science Channel? Maybe that's why. Do you have the Science Channel? I have no idea, to tell you the truth. It's weird. I didn't, until like a month ago, I didn't know there was a Science Channel. Until I hear that Firefly is on the Science Channel, I did not know there was one either. But uh, there's so many channels as you go up the dial that it's hard to know. But yeah, I always thought that was cool. You see this the ship and, you know, all of a sudden the engine lights up and it blasts away and you don't hear a thing. It's just totally silent. And I liked that, you know, they stuck with that and st instead of giving you the boom when you see it, you know. Well, they also could have had the camera like swooping through the bridges while they're blowing or being right there up close and it all being about the beauty of the destruction as some filmmakers are wont to do. By pulling back, it made it uglier. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was not a good thing that we were looking at. Right. And I liked that. The explosion wasn't what it was all about, but it was the fact that they're being isolated is what it was all about instead. I like that. Uh, geez, here I'm about to contradict what I was saying before. Uh, one of the things that I like about Marvel versus DC is that for the most part, 
the bad guys are always more powerful than the good guys in Marvel. Uh -huh. And in DC, the good guys are always more powerful than the bad guys. And, and of course, there are exceptions in both camps. But Batman, despite his billions and resources and all that, was the underdog in this movie. And he was the weaker of the two. And, you know, the, the, and Bane had just armies at his disposal and wheels within wheels. And, and just, you know, Batman was always a step behind. And to me, that was really it went a long way to make us root for him to see somebody like Batman being the underdog. And, and, and you know what? That's something that works for Batman a lot of times because he is a man, a regular man. He's not a Kryptonian and he doesn't have a magic ring and he doesn't have a lasso that can make you tell the truth. You know, he's a human being who can be killed. Superman can't be killed. Doomsday notwithstanding. And so for them to do that, to exploit that, I, I also really liked that. Yeah, that, that was very cool. Batman, in the last one, he was kind of at the peak of his form or whatever. You know, he was r ready to handle anything. And in this case, yeah, they, they started it up. And it, I, I found that kind of interesting. You know, they started it up eight years later, which is always kind of weird when you get a movie that in the story world, it's happening farther apart than the release of the two movies. You know what I mean? Like episode two was 10 years after episode one. Right. Is that what you mean? Yeah, you usually don't get that kind of a thing very often. You know, you get a movie, a sequel will start very soon after the last one will or... Immediately after. Yeah, or they just give you the time, you know, okay, it's been three years because it was three years since the, the original movie came out or whatever kind of a thing. It's not very often that where they go farther, like episode one or like Batman, Dark Knight Rises... But yeah, they, they started out with him, I don't know, I, I was curious, why was he carrying around a, a cane and, and hobbling like that? Was there a reason for that that was explained? Because he was shot, right? Was he? Was he not shot at the end of Dark Knight? I, you know, dude, it's been so long, I cannot remember. I, all I remember is him running away from the dogs, the police and stuff like that at the very end, and him having to be the villain or whatever. Because he can take it. Right. And because he's the hero Gotham deserves, needs. Oh, shoot. <laughs> it's been too long for me, too. There were some showings where they showed Batman Begins and then The Dark Knight and then The Dark Knight Rises. Uh, but it was like 40 something dollars. And it would have been fun. But both of us own those first two movies. So we could just watch them before we go to it, you know. I'm sort of ashamed that I didn't watch Dark Knight. I did watch Batman Begins two weeks ago, and I meant to watch Dark Knight a week ago. But it was Comic-Con, and so it didn't work. Right, yeah. I figured uh, my son has been saying he wants to see this new Dark Knight movie, and so I figured I would watch those two with him before we go to see that third one because he hasn't seen either of them yet. He's finally to the age where he can uh, you know, be able to handle that kind of stuff. But he wasn't before. I wasn't going to let him see it. And, you know, that's another thing that I like about these movies. They're not dumbed down for the most part, uh, especially the first two. They're for adults. They're for grownups. They're thoughtful, cerebral films. Now, they're not Inception, but there's things that you probably don't pick up on until you see it a second time. I, I like that. They, they, they don't dumb things down to go for that teenage boy audience. Right. And, uh, and I really appreciate that. And I think that's part of what makes them so beloved. It's part of why people love The Empire Strikes Back so much is when you're a child, you see certain things. And then when you're an adult, you see totally different things. And layers in Empire Strikes Back where you're like, wow, I used to love Jedi or I used to love Ewok Adventure so much more. <laughs> and now it's Empire all the way. And I think that that's something that uh, I guess we have to lay that at Nolan's feet. Because yeah. you look at Following or you look at Memento or you look at Insomnia or you look at Inception or Prestige. I, I think that's all of his movies. And they're all very thoughtful, cerebral films. Yeah. They don't beat you over the head or sit there and explain it to you, which some people don't like because they miss things. And then they're like, hey, what did he say? Why are they doing this? And then you're like, shut up. I'm trying to watch the movie. <laughs>
Well, I, I, you can definitely go too far in the other direction, but I haven't seen a single movie that Christopher Nolan has done that did. Inception was the hardest for me. I was just like, wow, the, the keeping straight the the layers of the dreams and stuff like that and what the goals are in each one. That was hard. And it made me wonder about middle America and whether they would reject that film. And it's impressive that they didn't, that it was such a big hit right. for as deep and difficult as it was. Is there anything else you want to talk about in this episode or should we call it a night and go on to the next one? I think we can call it a night and move on. We're running out of time anyway, so. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for joining us again. And I've been Rich Outfield. And I've been Big Anglovich. We'll see you next time. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Please, sir, that gets my goat is produced under Creative Commons 3.0 license. But you're free to steal it. But it was an event that was in the middle of the night uh, at a t- that a ton of people were going to be at. And if it had been a midnight mass on Christmas Eve, you know, it's, 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 I think the point was someplace where you could just walk in and not be noticed and take out a whole bunch of people. And I don't know that how much it had to do with the subject matter of the movie. Now, that's my opinion. There's going to be a lot of discussion in the coming weeks about – movie violence and comic book violence and whether we should chemically castrate all of our kids and, and, and just awful overreactions to this thing. Um, unfortunately, we've lived through this already with the Columbine shootings just a decade ago, a little more than a decade, which was also in Colorado. And I would hope that in a dozen years, we've grown as a society and realized that that doesn't accomplish anything to say, Let's place the blame everywhere we can to make sure that the blame doesn't fall. Let's blame Janet Jackson's wardrobe malfunction, you know, um, and and I don't know. I You work in news, so you've probably seen a lot more finger pointing than I have already. But it, has it been on the same level as, as how Columbine was immediately after?